Hey guys, Cody B here bringing you a message from God's Word. This evening we are going to be in Luke 22, starting in verse 66, and we're going to work our way down through uh, Luke 23 and in, in verse 12. Tonight we're going to look at the 12, excuse me, not the 12, the three trials of Jesus Christ. It's important for us to understand for, for several reasons. If Jesus had these trials take place in America today, he wouldn't have been convicted. If he would have been convicted, his conviction would have been overturned. You need to realize, in order to get this conviction, they had to lie. And not only did they have to lie, but they had to put political pressure upon Pilate. To get the conviction they wanted. And even then Pilate didn't give them the conviction they wanted. He just told them. He just washed his hands when it was over. And said do do whatever you want with them. I don't, I don't care. Pilate wasn't someone who cared. He, he didn't want this on his lap. He knew Jesus was innocent. But at the same time. He didn't care enough to actually. Fight for Jesus. To, to walk away freely. Um, Pilate for lack of a better word right now, Pilate was a scoundrel, in in my opinion. And I know it seems like, you know, Pilate stands up for him, stands up for him. At the same time, Pilate had the power to release him. And he didn't because he didn't care enough to. We'll begin in Luke 22 in verses 66 through 71. This is his, Jesus' first trial. And, and in this trial, he is before what we call the Sanhedrin. It's, it's the chief priests. It's the religious leaders. It's your... Uh, Pharisees, your your top Pharisees, it's your it's your top Sadducees, it's the it's the high priests, it's it's his officials, and it is the ruling religious body of the first century Israelites. That's who he's in front of. And it's important for us to understand. This isn't the first time he's been in front of these guys. Now, it's, it's the first time he's been in front of them in an in a official capacity. But he had talked to these guys all week long. You know, if you remember, when you go back and look at, look at Luke 18, 19, 20, 21, he had been talking to the chief priests. He had been talking to the Sadducees. He had been talking to the Pharisees in the streets. He had been teaching them and teaching their people. And remember the whole lesson we did that was called trickery. Um, they were trying to trick Jesus, and they couldn't. They were trying to get him to say something, intentionally get him to mess up, so they could have reason to execute him. They couldn't. So instead, they paid off Judas to uh, ambush him at night. And this is where we are. Verse 66, And when it was day, the council of elders of the people assembled, both chief priests and scribes, and they led him away to the council chamber, saying, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, I, If I tell you, you will not believe. If I ask a question, you will not answer. This is verses 66 and 68. And the thing is, he's not just... You know, Jesus was God in the flesh, okay? He had great insight humans don't have. But the thing is, you don't have to have great insight to know that. Jesus had said this previously, and we had seen this previously in, in the Gospel of Luke. Remember when when Jesus asked, they asked Jesus this question, Jesus said, well, let me ask you a question. John the Baptist, was he from man or was he from God? And the Pharisees, you know, they get together, they, they start talking and say, well, if we say he's from man, the people will kill us because they believed in him. But if we say he's from God, then he will say, you know, then why didn't you believe in him? So instead they answer Jesus, well, we don't know where he came from. See, it was about not giving an answer. It was about trying to trap Jesus and, and, and at the same time, not grow, not learn, and, and try to stay out of what they thought were Jesus' traps. 
And that's what Jesus said here. If I ask you, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of God. Of, of, excuse me, will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. Jesus is quoting Psalm 110 in this text in verse 69. Uh, Psalm 110 verse 1. So I ask him again. And they all said, are you the son of God? Then you say he'll be seated at the right hand of power. Is that you? And Jesus said to them, yes, I am. They shouldn't have been surprised. He had said this before. The Pharisees admit in John chapter 3 that we know you are from God because no one can do these things unless God is with them. They had seen miracles for themselves. Miracles had been reported to them. They knew. They knew. But now they got him to admit it plainly in front of them, in front of a whole bunch of people who would twist his words. And that's exactly what's going to happen next. And they said, what further need do we have a testimony? For we have heard it ourselves from his own mouth. The difference is Jesus had not only proven it, but he was and he is the son of God. It wasn't a lie. It wasn't blasphemy. If anyone else had made the statement to be blasphemy, it'd be a lie. But for him, it wasn't a lie and it wasn't blasphemy. I believe the part of them knew it, especially when you look at, like I said, John 3 and the words of, of Nicodemus. And that's the first trial. Getting a confession out of Jesus, squeezing a confession out of him. When he had been confessing this for years. And not just confessing, but proving it as well. Moving on to Luke 23, verse one, the whole body of them arose and brought him before Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation, forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. That's the accusations. They're painting him to be rebellious in the eyes of Caesar. You know, Caesar was the emperor of Rome. He was the emperor of the Roman Empire. And essentially they're saying Jesus is, is making himself to be this king to overthrow the Roman Empire. They're saying that he's not paying taxes. He's telling people, and he's telling others not to pay taxes. And, and that's not true. Jesus said in, in the Gospel of Luke, Render to Caesar what is Caesar's, and render to God what is God's. He takes the coin and says, Who's, whose inscription is this? Who's, whose picture is this? And they said, it's Caesar's. Well, give to him what you, what you owe him. And give to God what you owe him. Anyway, he was encouraging the people to pay taxes. So they lie and they twist. Pilate takes Jesus. Look at verse 3. And Pilate asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, It is as you say. And Pilate said to the chief priests and the multitudes, I find no guilt in him. Now, looking at this face value with just this gospel, you got to keep in mind these trials are abbreviated in the gospel of Luke and they're expanded in some of the other gospels. But here, Pilate takes Jesus and says, are you a king? And Jesus says, yes, I am. <laughs> are you the king of the Jews? It is as you say. You're, you're right, I, I am. So what caused Pilate to say, I find no guilt in him. I find no fault in him. And for that answer, we need to turn to John 18, verse 36. And you can turn there and you can look at it for yourself. It's in the middle of this same trial of Jesus and Pilate, where Jesus and Pilate are discussing and teaching. And Jesus says a lot more in that text. And I specifically want to focus on the words in verse 36 where Jesus says to Pilate, 
My kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom were of this world. My servants were fight, would fight. You know what Jesus says in that text? We're not trying to overthrow anyone. Jesus is saying, you know, if we, if we want to overthrow someone, we my followers would have killed them when they first tried to arrest me. If you remember, in, in this gospel specifically, in, in Luke that we've been studying, Peter pulled out a sword. He cut off the, the ear of a servant. He went for the head. <laughs> and Jesus stopped him. Jesus healed the ear that had been cut off. Jesus would tell Peter, those who live by the sword will die by the sword. Jesus tells Pilate here, yeah, I'm a king, but it's not a kingdom you'd recognize. It's not a kingdom you're familiar with. It's a kingdom that's not of this world. We're not trying to overthrow anybody. He goes on to say, if my kingdom was of this world, my servants would fight, and they didn't, and they don't, and they won't. Turn back to Luke 23, verse 4. And Pilate said to the chief priests and the multitudes, I, I find no guilt in him. Pilate's like, look, I, we only tell you, n none of your people are dead. <laughs> He's not, none of my people are dead. None of my guards are dead. None of your guards are dead. He's not trying to overthrow anything. Verse 5, but they kept on insisting, saying, he stirs up the people teaching all over Judea starting with from Galilee, even as far as this place. The Sanhedrin says, but he's stirring everyone up. He's driving everyone crazy. He's getting everyone excited from all over Galilee, all over Judea, from Galilee to this place. This is what he's trying to do. In verse 6, but when Pilate heard it, he said, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him the Herod, who himself also was in Jerusalem at the time. Pilate says, wait, <laughs> this takes place in Galilee? <laughs> and he, he jumps on it. Like I said, he, he, just, he just wants to be done with these guys. He's, he's tired of these guys. These guys have driven him crazy in the past. And, and you can read that in, in, in history. Um, So he takes it off his plate, puts it on the plate of someone else, and he says, well, if, if he's a Galilean, then this is Herod's business. This isn't my business. And he has his guards and has the people take Jesus over to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem because of the festivals that were going on. In verse 8 and verse 12, we read the trials of Herod, and, and this is even less of a trial than what we had with the Sanhedrin and what we had with, with Pilate. Now, Herod was very glad when he saw Jesus, for he had wanted to see him for a long time because he had been hearing about him and was hoping to see some sign performed by him. Yeah, remember, Jesus was all over Galilee. He had multitudes following him. He had cast out demons and raised people from the dead and had, had healed the sick and healed the blind and the deaf and this and this and this and news of who he was had spread all over Galilee, all over Judea, all over Jerusalem. Herod had heard of this guy. Herod wanted to see a sign by him. Keep in mind, and we see this in the personality of Herod in this text, it wasn't to believe whether he was the son of God or not, it was simply so he would be entertained. This Herod was, was a clown. It was a joke. Look at what he even says about him in, in the text. In verse 9, he questioned him at some length, and, and Jesus answered him nothing. And the chief priests and the scribes were standing there, accusing him vehemently. So here he's, Herod is asking Jesus these questions. Jesus isn't answering. The scribes and the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin over here, you know, uh, accusing him vehemently. They're, they're you know, they're... I don't know. I've always pictured them of scowling or growling or not growling or little sense, but saying, he did this, he did this, he's doing this, he's doing this. Their anger showing. Verse 11, 
Herod and his soldiers, after treating him, Jesus, with contempt and mocking him, dressed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him back to Pilate. So Herod takes him, makes fun of him, laughs at him, treats him with contempt, mocks him, and then dresses him in a fancy robe and sends him back to Pilate. You know, you know what he's doing here? He's making fun of Jesus and he's teasing the, the Pharisees all at the same time. It's, it's a big joke to him. Or he's teasing the, the chief priests all, all at the same time. They're sitting here vehemently accusing him of something. And, and something serious. I mean, you know, rebellion against Rome is a serious deal. Capital offense. How's Herod respond? He laughs, he mocks, treats him with contempt, puts him in a big fancy robe. You know why he puts him in a big fancy robe? Essentially, he was dressed in Jesus like a king. He was making fun of Jesus, he was making fun of the scribes, he was making fun of the chief priests, all of them. At the same time, he was a partier. It was a big joke to him, and he sends him on back to Pilate. Something interesting happens here in verse 12. Now Herod and Pilate became friends with one another that very day, for before they had been enemies with each other. What Herod does with making fun of the scribes, making fun of the uh, chief priests, and making fun of Jesus is actually enjoyed by Pilate. <laughs> It's almost as if I always get the, the picture in my mind of Jesus coming back to Pilate with the robe, with the fancy robe, and Pilate seeing it and laughing. This was a joke to both of them. Pilate takes a little bit more seriously. But at the end of the day, Pilate doesn't care. And it will eventually lead to his crucifixion, the crucifixion of Jesus. He's the son of God. Think about that. This is the trials of God in the flesh. They're lies, twisting of words, apathy, and a joke. That's how he's treated. And that's how these trials were, were treated. These trials would be thrown out in the American court system. They weren't fair. They weren't right. But he goes through them all. In a calm, peaceful manner. Because although he knows he's being mistreated, and although he knows he's performing for a clown, Jesus also knows that this is all worth it. Or he believes it's worth it. To save our sins. To save us from eternal death. To save us from suffering. May God bless and I hope you have a wonderful day.